Hey everybody, Pastor Brett here. Merry Christmas Eve. We're just about to start second service. Uh, take a look. Got a great message for you today. Amazing worship. Take a look at the video. If you like it, subscribe, pass it on. Have a Merry Christmas. For the first time in history, I believe every billboard in Times Square was shut off for one reason. To celebrate the Savior. People are so busy saying, look what the world has come to. But Christmas is a time when believers can stop and turn it around and say, look what has come to the world. That's our Savior. Let's pray like it's Christmas Eve, okay? Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for what it means, what Christmas means and we know in our lives you are the reason for the season and you always will be, Lord. But the shocking truth is to you, the reason for the season was us. God, thank you. Thank you for coming the way you did and remaining. Well, we can't wait to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 All right. Again, good morning. Uh, Happy Merry Christmas Eve. Before we begin our, our assignment today, the word that I believe the Lord has for us, um, it's in John 1.14. If you have your Bible, go ahead and go there. If you don't have your Bible, we have it on the notes and you can look at that. And I want to just tell you our approach. Uh, it's in John 1.14 and I know that the Gospels of Luke and Matthew normally give the Christmas story. Matthew 1 and 2, Luke 1 and 2, that's a great place. If you want to read the Christmas story, just go read Matthew 1 and 2, Luke 1 and 2. It'll tell you everything that was going on then and what it was like as the Savior came into the world. But John 1.14, where we're going to camp out today, it, um, it provides a different, a different kind of a perspective. Um, it talks about the reality of Jesus coming. It talks about the relevance of Jesus coming. Is it relevant to my life? And also our response. And John provides us with, it's kind of like the backstory, and, or maybe you could call it the theology behind the nativity. So, the first one for your notes, we'll get right into note number one. It's the reality of Christ's coming. Jesus really did come, and it really is the greatest gift. We shouldn't have to say that on Christmas. It's Christmas, everybody's celebrating, but everybody's celebrating. And uh, many aren't really sure what they're celebrating. They just know it's time for gifts and time to indulge and time for love and peace and uh, goodwill toward one another. But they don't recognize that the only reason we can celebrate love and peace and goodwill towards men is because of the Lord. And John 1.14 says it this way, the word became flesh. If you know that verse that the word became flesh in the beginning was the word, the word and the word was with God, with God and the word was 
God. Whoa, so God himself is the word, the spoken word. That's why there's a thing called revelation or rhema. Rhema revelation is the spoken word. And it's a kind of thing where revelation is revealed that the light actually, we get illumination in our spirits because God said something and it was God and it manifests and we're changed. And so the word, God himself became flesh and dwelt among us. And it says we have seen his glory and I want you to circle the word glory. Glory is very important in today's message. Uh, glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. That right there is the theology behind the nativity, which is our symbol for Christmas that we're going to talk about. So the first part of that, the Word became flesh. Everybody say that with me. The Word became flesh. This is the single most unique quality of Christianity that makes it different from every other religion. And I know I don't like to use the word religion. I use it sometimes because it describes a faith based system. But religion, a lot of people, I, they're, they're shocked to know that you're a person who goes to church and believes in God. But you, I say, well, I'm not religious. They go, I thought you were a pastor. I said, well, I am. That doesn't mean I have to be religious about it because I feel like religion is man's attempt to get to God. But Christmas is God's attempt to get to man. But um, no other, as I said last week, um, nobody else can say what we can say is that our founder is God. The God himself became flesh. So the miracle of Christmas is in the infinite becoming the infant. It's a good little play on words. The infinite becomes the infant, but it's also very true. The whole foundation and, and superstructure of Christianity rests on this truth, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And that's hard to grasp. It's been something I wrestled with for many years. How can, how can uh, fully God and fully man, I can't understand it, but that just reminds me that I didn't come up with it. And I'll try for as long as I'm able to think about that and get a grasp on it, but it's hard to grasp in my finite human mind. I need the Holy Spirit to illuminate that to me. And I think you probably do too. Jesus is fully God and fully man. A, a theologian described it this way, God must be able to come over to our side without leaving his own side. There's an astronaut by the name of James Irwin. He was the eighth man to set foot on the moon. He said this about Christmas. He said, there's something more important than man walking on the moon, and that is God walking on the earth. Give God a hand. He met us where we are, like we, like we sang, that he came to where we were. And like Kiana talked about this morning, he had no boundaries. He who is outside of time stepped into time. He is who is infinite became finite. He who had, uh, who is spirit became flesh. And notice the next phrase, phrase <clears throat> excuse me, it says he dwelt among us. Dwell refers to really the the. Origin is pitching one's tent. It's kind of cool. I love the references to tents for obvious reasons. More specifically, it means to settle, to stay, and to inhabit. So it's a process. It's not just a, 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 a landing, so to speak. I mean, if you're going to go pitch a tent, there's more to it than that. You've got to know where you're going to stay, and you've got to prepare the ground a little bit, and it has to be flat, and you have to set it up and do some things. And Jesus did a lot of things. God did a lot of things in preparation before he came in and uh, set up his tent here with us. One paraphrase puts it like this. Jesus came and moved into our neighborhood. To say that Jesus pitched a tent implies that he wants to be on familiar terms with us. He wants to be close. He wants a lot of interaction. If you ever share a tent with somebody, you know, not too many secrets. Even, even a big tent like this one. We get to know each other pretty well under this roof. And when we think about what dwelt among us means, we might be tempted to think that Jesus came just to hang out with us. <coughs> Just to hang out with us is an image that a, a lot of casual believing, non-church going people have adopted that as their own. Well, bro, Jesus loves us, man. He's just love. He just, we just love. You hang out, hung out with people like us and hung out with sinners and, you know, just Jesus, man. <laughs> love, bro. Now, he does love us and he does, he does like spending time together. 
But Jesus was on a rescue mission from heaven when he came to this earth. And part of why he came was to rescue us, but also to clear up a lot of misconceptions that we had, that man had. Even with Christmas, man, we've added this and we've added that and we've added this and we've added that and we've added this and we added that. We added so much stuff we forgot the root reason about all of it. And Jesus came and goes, man, they got all of these rules and laws and when to wash their hands and what threads they can mix on what days and what to burn here and what to what to wash there. And when I can say this and not say that and eat this and not eat that and work and don't work. And he's like, oh, stop. It's kind of like on the record, you know, wah, wah, wah. I need to change things. He was disruptive and he had to disrupt things to correct some misconceptions about who God really was. And John uses a specific word that would make his first century readers remember the tent of meeting. It was the tent of meeting where God met with the Israelites in the Old Testament. Another really cool word about the tent of meeting or a description is tabernacle. A tabernacle was a portable worship center where God dwelt and met with his people. It's a reminder that God can show up wherever he wants and that structures are not churches. People are the church. And, and so the tabernacle, it was also a place where, you know, sacrifices were made, where worship takes place, where God's glory and God's holiness was on full display. I want you, as we talk about glory, to try to get a picture. Try to get a picture of something that's hard to picture. I mean, you can picture a podium and you can picture a cross and you can picture a Bible. But picturing God's glory, it can be an elusive thing. So... There's a reason why, but try to get a picture. In Exodus 40, after the tabernacle was completed, it says God's glory filled it to overflowing. God's glory filled it to overflowing. Let, let me read it to you. Then the cloud of meeting, I'm sorry, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Well, that might feel like, oh, it was a nice atmosphere. No, no, listen. Moses wasn't even able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Like there was no room for Moses in a big tent. It was too full. Full of what? Full of God's glory. I mean, if it's full of furniture, you can move the furniture. You can it's tangible and and you can it's it's solid. But the glory of God, how can it be so full that nothing else could get in? It's kind of difficult to define. It means heavy. It means weight. The glory of God means weight, but it means so much more. It means important. It means profound. It means significant. It means having great reputation, which has to do with the fame of the name of God, Yahweh. It, it means splendor. It means brightness. It means majesty, worthiness, and honor. And the irony the irony that we could experience something so absolutely amazing. That's the glory of God. It refers to God's presence with God's people. The Jewish rabbis coined a, an expression, uh, you may have heard it, the Shekinah glory. That's cool. Shekinah glory. It doesn't mean kind of glory. It means the Shekinah glory. It's a form that literally means he caused to dwell. It's what made the intangible tangible. It's what made something that we can't describe or put our finger on so tangible that we can't even get into a place because the glory filled the space. It's awesome to me. For many years, people met with God and they knew of His glory through the tabernacle. That's where they would learn and become intimate with this thing called the glory of God. And later on, God instructed King Solomon to build not a temporary uh, worship place like a tabernacle, but a permanent worship center called the temple. We know about the temple, right? In 1 Kings 6, 13, after finishing construction, God says this. And I will dwell among the children of... Babe, you're in second service. <laughs> you never come to second service. Someone else helped in the, in the, with the babies and the... You guys, thank you so much. I know. I, I got... I'm sorry. I got a short attention span and I can squirrel with the best of them. But... I miss her during second service, and I know that a lot of people miss her because she's always serving with the kids, and so there's people who say, I've been in, I haven't seen her for weeks because she's busy with the babies. I'm so happy to see you. I'm inspired. I'm going to really preach now. Um, <laughs> but if you do want to help with the kids, we have some openings. 
<laughs> Sorry, Lord, I was quoting you. Um, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. That's what God said after the temple was built. ba -bum, there it is, a temple. All to God's specifications, built by the richest man who ever lived. And there's the temple. And he said, I'm going to dwell there and I will not forsake my people Israel. Now in 1 Kings 8, 10, through, 10 and 11, he, it says, And a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. And what I want to say is it makes it sound like, you know, we say, I can't stand that. Oh, I can't stand that. It's not that they didn't want to and they didn't like to and they couldn't stand to minister. They couldn't stand to minister because the glory of the Lord was too heavy that they would have to just fall right down. And have you ever felt the weight of God to that degree? I'll never forget some one day somebody was uh, canvassing a neighborhood in San Bernardino where we used to live. And it was these kids and they were, you know, Jehovah's Witness had them in training and they were knocking on doors. And I started to talk to them about faith and about I wasn't a pastor yet, I don't think, but I was just. You know, God just prompted me, and they're at my door. I mean, you came here, let's talk. And then all of a sudden, the older and the elders are coming along, and, and they got kind of mad, and they tried to take these girls, and, try, and there was kind of this thing going on while they're trying to witness. And my wife was in the house, and she said she never felt physically, tangibly, God forced her to her knees like she did in that moment. But she hit the deck in prayer because she knew I was in spiritual warfare out in the front yard, and that maybe the lives of these two young teenagers were somewhere, you know, at stake. But thank you. Like, that's the glory when you can't, you can't stand to minister. You just have to bow down. And, uh, you know, you know that's how you get back on your feet, right? Yeah. You get on your knees. Amen. You know that's the best, strongest fighting position you could ever get is being on your knees so you can get back on your feet. And God will honor you. So God's going to do that. It says they couldn't stand to minister for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. The presence of God can crowd out absolutely everything else, you guys. And that doesn't mean nothing's welcome. What it means is it's practical advice for you because how many have had things in their life that they didn't want in their life? And you go, oh, I just can't get, I can't get away from this thing. I can't, I can't get away from this thing that I won't let go of. You know, I, I can't. I can't, it just follows me wherever I go. It just follows me. It's like I walk backwards and it goes with me. I go forward and here it comes. So <laughs> what I'm saying is the glory, the presence of God will drive out what's unwanted in your lives. The presence of God. Well, I got all this stuff in my way and I can't get away from it. The presence of God. I got all these people. I got all these people in my house and all around. The presence of God will drive out. Well, there's these habits and there's, these, there's this stuff and it's around and it's just around me in the presence of God. Well, I don't know. There's beers in the refrigerator and I'm trying not to drink it. The presence of God will drive out the beer. The presence of God will drive out everything that's trying to take you down. But you have to want the presence of God. You got a hunger for the presence of God. And just like the word says, it'll crowd out absolutely everything else. This is the most practical advice you will ever hear in your life. If you got something in your life and it needs to go, first of all, you invite God in by the authority of Christ. You tell it to go and you embrace the presence of God and there won't be room for anything else to get inside your tent. So Moses can't even go. Moses, God's man, he can't even go into the tabernacle because God's glory was filling it and the priests couldn't get in either. The glory of God filled the temple for about 350 years. But then because of people's persistent sin and rebellion, I was going to say because of, you know, the persistence of sin, but sin's not what's persistent, it's people. It's the persistent sin of people, which is a willful thing. And the rebellion of the people, God raised up the Babylonians. If you know your biblical history, God raised up the Babylonians. Or even if you don't, that's what happened. And, <laughs> and then the, the, the God, raised up, God raised up the enemy? Yeah. Daniel, what? Yeah. Wait, God, why would God raise up the enemy? Why, why would God raise up the enemy and the Babylonians? And then they would destroy the temple that he told Solomon to build. God's glory then departs. When you read it, you see that it didn't just depart. It departed slowly 
and reluctantly. You could see God not wanting to go. He's like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go, but I'm going to go. Listen to this. First, the glory leaves the Holy of Holies. That's the inner chamber. The inner chamber, there's, a, there's the courts, and then there's another chamber. and then there's a, It's like your heart. Your heart's your inner chamber. There's a place that you're supposed to guard above all things. It's your inner chamber. It's your Holy of Holies. That's why Jesus has to be more than a theory to us if we're ever going to be truly saved and sanctified, if we're ever going to re receive the benefits and it's not just benefits, but it's everything that Jesus offers. So God left the Holy of Holies. And then the, the glory of the Lord hovered over the threshold of the door. Wait, there's the Holy of way inside, but then he, he was out there now in a different place. Um, it was at the east gate where he hovered over the threshold of the door. Listen to Ezekiel eleven twenty three. It says, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city. So it went from the inner... Holy of Holies to the east gate to a mountain. It just stood on the mountain on the east side of the city. Wait, 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 bro. I thought God wanted to hang out with his people. He does. But he wants it to be a two-way street. It's not a one-sided affair. Have you ever been stood up on a date? If you haven't, I'm sure you've seen the movies where they, they, there's this love affair that looks like it's about to blossom and they schedule a time and I'll, I'll meet you at the place at a certain time. And one of them shows up at the table with the linens and the little wine glasses and, and the watch shows like this and the waiter comes and the table for one, no two. Okay. And you know, there's one person, but the clock, they show the clock in the movies. Lots of movies have done it, but it communicates something. It's like, wait, wait, they're not showing up. I thought we had a I thought we had a deal. I thought we had a covenant. I thought we had an arrangement. And yet hours go by because it meant so much to the one who did show up that hours go by. What might have been a lunch date is now a dinner date gone awry. And God wants it to be a two-way street, but it wasn't. And as a result, God is no longer dwelling with his people and the display of his glory on earth becomes a distant memory. How sad. The glory has departed. That's a phrase in the Bible, Ichabod. The glory has departed. It's one of the saddest phrases. You know, so often people don't realize what they have until it's gone. And Isaiah 64, 1 captures the heart, I believe, the plea on the people as they now, because they know now. There comes a time where you know. You know when the glory has departed. You know when the presence of God is no longer there. And listen to what they pray. Oh, this cry lasts for centuries, by the way, because God on earth now is gone. He says, oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down. How the mountains would quake in your presence. They're pleading with God that you would just burst out of heaven and the mountains would shake as you'd come down. And everything would be different again. We just sang it. I think I think it was last week where we did we sing. Oh, come Emmanuel last week. Was that the one? Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Not yet? Oh, it's tonight. Oh, it's tonight. You got to be here tonight. I'll give you a sneak peek, but it won't be as good. But it says, and ransom captive Israel. Like, come, come, ransom. We're, we're in chains. We are in bondage. You come and ransom us, God. The heavens are silent for four centuries, you guys. 400 years, Grandpa Joe. 400. And until Harold the angel comes and starts to hearken. And, and I know, no one laughed at first service either, but Harold... It's not an angel. It's a herald angel. It's a messenger that comes to announce in Luke 2, 9. Now we're back to the traditional Christmas verses. Um, and this is what makes the whole Christmas story so much more dramatic. It's not just that God does what they prayed, that he bursts from the heavens and comes down and pew, shows himself to the, to the shepherds in the field. That's magnificent and huge, but it's been centuries. This is not commonplace. It says here that Luke 2, 9, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. Their knees were knocking. They were frightened. No wonder what the angel said next. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Seems like the angels are always saying that every time they show. It must be a very terrifying experience. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. He's like, for behold... 
This is why you shouldn't be afraid, because I'm bringing you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, cloths, and lying in a manger. Now, God spoke this to a king long, long before. I won't go too far into it, but this was when this was the advice to the king. The king was being besieged by Syria on all sides, and there was... It was already prophesied that, the, the, that had to, the Savior had to come through the house of David and Judah. And he's telling him, here, I got a sign for you. The guy's like, I don't want a sign. He goes, no, I don't, don't make God tired. Listen, there's a sign. And here's the sign. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. How is that a sign? Because until that happens... Well, but God's going to finish. I'm trying to keep this short. God's going to finish what he started. And if there's no baby yet that you have found, you don't have to worry about these enemies. It's kind of what God has said to us all along. The key is the baby in the manger. And the angel said, he quoted the old verse, and he said, this will be a sign, a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. So perfection comes to take on himself the sin of the entire population of the world. Why? Why? Because, because man makes a lousy God. All right? We make a lousy God. But the reason that he comes, perfection comes to imperfection, to take on the sins of the world, is so that those who are sinful can be made righteous. He also came to erase misconceptions about God and provide an accurate, living, tangible example of who God was, what he was like in a way that the world had never seen. Now, in this time, it's been rough. They've been waiting for good news. There was turmoil. There were there were oppression and wars and violence, and the people could not wait to invite God into their difficulties. It was dark and they couldn't wait to. Turn on the light switch. They've been waiting for a Messiah to come. A Messiah is Savior. They've been waiting. And then a whole army. Can you imagine? One angel is terrifying. A whole army of adoring angels breaks through the heavens and proclaims that God's glory has now returned. In the form of a baby, by the way. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. Another line from them. These, these worship songs are great, by the way. We take them for granted. But listen to Silent Night. Silent Night, Holy Night. Shepherds quake at the sight. Glories stream from heaven. I was going to ask you to sing that, but I forgot to ask you. So, Glories stream from heaven afar. Heavenly hosts sing Alleluia. So God's good news comes into our bad news. That's a prayer. You ever don't know what to pray? I'm not a good prayer. I don't know what to pray for people. People come to you for prayer. They got some bad news. You tell, you just pray that God's good news will come burst from the heavens into their bad news right now and manifest in a way that they'll never forget. God's good news comes into our bad news. But with it, there's a couple of principles. Um, one truthful principle is that God's good news doesn't always look like good news. Right? I mean, sometimes God's good news looks just like the bad news that we're accustomed to. I mean, it, it's glory, but it, but it looks gory. <laughs> it's paradoxical because Christmas, I heard that song this morning somewhere, and it was like, it's the most wonderful time. That's what Christmas is supposed to be, the most wonderful time of the year. It's about goodwill to all men, love and family, sitting in front of a crackling fire, drinking whatever, and eating cookies, and talking about good times. But... If you have been walking with the Lord for any time, you know that God's greatest gifts are often wrapped up in problems. They come with different, different wrapping paper. It might come... Uh, huh? Have you ever gotten a gift that you had no idea was a gift? You thought you were being punished. I mean, gifts can come wrapped up as anxiety or worry or chaos or frustration or fear about the future. And here you think it's a gift that you're running away or you think it's you think it's some kind of punishment. And you're running away from what God actually might have a gift for you. God's greatest gifts. They come to us camouflaged in a colorful array of unpleasant circumstances and repulsive ideas where the first thing I want to do is not unwrap it. I'm going to bolt. I'm headed for the door. That ain't no gift. I don't know what that's all about. I rebuke you. God, I thought we... Mm. <laughs> Look, 
you, it, a great gift might be wrapped up in being fired from a job or having to move to a brand new location that you know can't be a gift. It might come in a package that looked like someone that you thought you couldn't live without walked away from you and left you stranded. It might look like a colossal failure or defeat in business or something that you had your heart set on that just didn't go right. And somehow God allowed something to happen and you didn't know it was a gift. But you can look back and go, you know what, if that never would have happened and if that never would have happened and you start to connect these dots and you go, what a gift. God can give you a gift and you can't you might not even see it. You could feel punished or penalized or not recognize or discern the gift at all. And maybe the gift wasn't even a problem to you at first. Maybe you got SNIOPed. Anybody ever been SNIOPed? That's one of my favorite acronyms. It, it means susceptible to the negative influence of other people. SNIOPed. You know, you just get around the right people and they can ruin anything. It could be a problem that other people have when they look at your gift. And, and they're not happy for you at all. And it might feed into your negative opinion of the gift that you got. They certainly aren't celebrating it with you. and They're not lining up and traveling across the country to come and worship the gift, that's for sure. More people often want to come and just kill the gift. Some are so threatened, they feel like the gift needs to just be destroyed. And here you are trying to process. God's good news looked like bad news to Herod, King Herod, because he was afraid that someone would take his throne. It looked like bad news to Joseph because someone else got his fiance pregnant. That could crush a man. So he planned to divorce her. Just quietly, just going to put her away. The thing is, and Joseph knew this, that secrets like that don't stay secret, especially not in small towns. But God's so amazing that he sent an angel. He, can, he has ways to convince people. Um, it didn't look good for religious leaders because, well, you know, uh, leading the religious was their job. That's their job. Looked like bad news. The shepherds were terrified. That's usually not a sign of someone being uh, receiving good news. They were terrified at the sight of the angels in the field. It had to have been scary to Mary because the first thing the angel said was, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Mary. You've been blessed among women. You're going you're to you're be with child. And can you imagine? It had to have been scary. They said, don't be afraid. God's got you. Now, to the common folk, we talked about some of them last week. To them, it wasn't scary enough. Because who's afraid of a baby? How can the government be on his shoulders? How's he going to rule? How's he going to lift our oppressors and set us free and get us out of captivity? It wasn't scary enough. So they didn't even bother to go six miles to check it out. Last week's message, if you didn't get it, talks about six miles a lot. So what's, the, what's, what's, what's all this mean? It means that God does not operate according to our practices or our protocols. He is God all by himself. He always has been and he always will be. And he doesn't even need our help. He does not even need our help. He doesn't need my help. It certainly doesn't need my help. Oh, yeah. I love, I love that he allows me to have a part in anything that he's doing, but certainly doesn't need me to accomplish his purposes. He is God all by himself. And so what God's going to bless you might take you out of your normal holiday and express experience where you plan to stay. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm sure it was a much longer walk than Mary and Joseph thought, and they probably plan to stay at an inn or a boarding house. It might be outside the comfort uh, or your comfort zone beyond what's politically correct or what you ever imagined, the blessing may not smell good to you at all and your bunkmates might be animals. But you just might be serenaded by angels as you behold the face of God and you didn't even see it as a gift. God's good news comes into our bad news, but in a very profound and emphatic way. Now, remember, we were talking about the glory in the tent, right? How the glory came down. It was filled. It was filled. It, it, there wasn't room for anything else. And it was in the tent of meetings. Now, I hope you can make this connection. In a similar way that God dwelt with his people in the tabernacle and in the temple, he now dwells with people 
through His only Son, Jesus Christ. In Him, the glory of God has descended and He has pitched His tent to dwell within us, you guys. To dwell within us. He didn't pitch a fit. He pitched a tent right here. Centuries of waiting are now over. This is so historic. It's why Christmas isn't a day. It's not a day. It's not a week. It's all year long. The whole reason for everything else revolves around Christmas. This even revolves around Christmas. God's glory was previously tied to a place. But now it's wrapped up in a person. And when we put our faith in him, his glory comes and resides within us. Is this making sense? According to 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. So the first point for your notes we just got through, Jesus really did come and it really is the greatest gift. There's no other great gift. There's no other gift that can even compare every gift we've ever given each other, even the big ones that you want to tell all your relatives. Oh, I go, took my honey on a cruise. We went to a cruise to Alaska and got a new car. That's like take all the cars and all the vacations and all the cruises and everything we've saved up for because it's wood, hay, and stubble, and it burns up. But the gift of Christ lasts for eternity, longer than any of us can ever imagine. So what does it mean? So we're going to go to the second part, which is the relevance. The relevance of the coming of Christ. What meaning does it have for me in my life? Does it really mean something? And if so, what? So the relevance of his coming, here it is. If we didn't need a Savior, God wouldn't have sent one. And you know me, I like simple. I, I don't think that you have to be, go to seminary and, and have 13 degrees and, and know all these different languages to, to figure out what God's trying to say. God can say what he wants in a language we can all understand. And here's a verse. Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. How simple is that? Pretty simple. Huh, Trinity? Simple, huh? God's, a, God's people, because uh, he's, he's, God's children are people, he became a people. Oh, I get that. Okay, um, for only as a human being, only as a person could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. So what scares everybody more than anything else? Dying. That's why you defeat the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony, and loving your life not unto death, meaning our things that I will give my life for that are more important than my life, but... If you don't get to that point, then death is the most important thing that you have. That it's your biggest enemy. It's your biggest fear for most people. And it says that only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power over death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. So God's children are people. He became a person so he could defeat the devil because the devil was in charge of death that we were so afraid of, but when he beat him, then there were no more slaves because nobody was a slave to fear anymore because God came as a person. Is that hard? It's not hard. I probably just made it more hard. But what's, that, that's what's so amazing about Christmas. Why, it's why it matters so much because God became human and death has no power over the believer. And here's another, full, uh, another wonderful thing about Jesus. He knows where you're at. He knows how you feel. He knows, Corey. He knows. He knows the worst. He knows the best. You don't have to try to explain it. You could try to tell somebody else, how you doing? Well, you know, you can tell them and like I do. Does that make sense? I mean, God doesn't, you don't have to say that. He knows exactly. Hebrews goes on to say that we don't have a high priest that can't sympathize with our weakness because he has been at all points tempted and he knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be tired. He knows what it's like to be opposed. So when you talk to him, you can't say, like, you don't know, you don't know my situation. You don't know what it's like. I mean, you could say that, but um, it would be wrong. Because if you did, he's going to go, yes, I do. I know every trial and every human emotion and every feeling, and I came to overcome every one of them. He's not just the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of the Pieces. And all of us have been in pieces at some time or another. And there's only one who can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Only one. He said, I'm going to give my life. 
I'm going to let the ones I came for, the ones I love, I'm going to let them kill me. And in reality, he said, you don't take my life, I give it. And then I'm going to come back. And we know no one's ever done that one on their own. I'm going to come back and I'm going to do that to show that I have the power over even your biggest enemy. Follow me. Death itself. Mm -mm, I got power. Follow me. That's what he did. So it's Christmas. And the, here's the greatest gift of all. Emmanuel. God with us. Emmanuel. God with us. There's no greater gift. If you ponder the last part of John 1.14, the verse that we started with, it says that he came the, the, full of grace and truth. The word full means abounding or complete. It means full. Grace refers to a favor done without expectation of return. Like not, nothing, I don't have to worry about trying to get something back. It's, it's grace. And it's, um, you, you know what I mean when someone, it's grace. It's like, here, it's undeserved favor. And truth has the, the concept of being factual, pure, sincere, and completely without error. So grace and truth, just real quick, they're, they're two concepts that don't often appear together except in a sermon or with Jesus. Um, as humans, we usually err on one side or the other. If we stress grace, we can be too quick to cut somebody slack at just to have ridiculous tolerance. If we pull the truth trigger too quickly, we can, you can wipe somebody out, leave them in shambles. Grace without truth can lead to sloppy sentimentality. Truth without grace can lead to religion and legalism. With Jesus, you, you can always count on both. Truth and grace. He tells the truth about your situation and about your sins. Anybody? Oh, yeah. But then his grace causes him to stick with you. No, even, though, even though he told me exactly he in, almost in my face, and he stuck with me anyway. Yeah. I like what Max Lucado writes. I love it, actually. It says, God loves you just the way you are. That's grace. But he loves you too much to let you stay that way. That's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So at Christmas time, we're reminded that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Now, a wonderful truth is that the lowly manger is the throne filled with the awesome majesty of God's glory and grace. That's amazing. That's awesome. But we're also faced with, I would call it a terrible truth, that because of our sin, Jesus Christ came to die for us as a substitute. I mean, it's good, but it's, you know. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So in case you're thinking, not my sin. Sorry to inform you. Because he's full of grace, you can come to him just like you are without having to clean up your act. I wish, oh, I wish if I could get one thing across to people. It's like, don't, don't do anything, just come. Yeah. That's all he says. Oh, I'm going to, they, they want to, I mean, so many people, they say, oh, your tent's probably going to fall down if I come there. Oh, the place going to, oh, yeah. I'm like, it's, it didn't fall down when we came in. I mean, like, don't do anything. Just come. Yeah. That's why, bro, that he's hanging out with prostitutes and, and drug dealers and, you know, in the alleys. That's why, because it didn't matter. Just follow me. That's all he said. He didn't just stay there. He said, come on, let's go. Come on, let's go. Go and sin no more. I wish people would get that. You don't have to do anything. Just come and he'll do the rest. Because he's full of grace, you come just as you are without having to clean up your act. And because he's full of truth, you can come in complete confidence knowing that he's going to keep his promise to forgive you and grant you eternal life. Like, you don't have to worry. Well, what if he doesn't? What if I do? What if I take the risk? And I like people. You know, I'll put yourself out there. And then what if I get hurt? You're not going to get hurt. You're going to get healed. Yeah. You're not going to get left. You're going to get Amen. taken, loved, embraced. God is not like any other force or any other person that we'll ever know. At Christmas, we see Jesus as 100% God and 100% man. Jesus became what he had never been before without losing what he had always been forever. Yeah. Because he's God. He's sovereign. Someone say sovereign. sovereign. 
Sovereign. What's that? It's unequivocally supreme. There's nothing even close. It's sovereign. But because he's man, he can be our substitute by taking our place and our punishment on the cross. God the Father is just and he demands payment for our sins. But because he is a God of grace, he provides the Savior. He provides the sacrifice who shed his blood as full payment for your and my sin. He is just and the justifier of those who place their faith in him. It's the best news. It's the greatest gift. There's no other. A little girl was frightened at night during a thunderstorm. She cried out for her daddy and he came and comforted her by saying, Honey, 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 don't worry. God loves you. Don't worry. God loves you. And he's going to take care of you. And just then there was like <laughs> lightning and the windows shook and the thunder rolled. And she said, Daddy, Daddy. And he gave her the same response. He said, Honey, God loves you and he's going to take care of you. Don't worry. And she's like, Daddy, I know God loves me, but right now I need someone with skin on. <laughs> Jesus is God with skin on. <clears throat> our response to his coming. Do we live for him? Thanks, Kiana. This is long, but let's have some nice music here while I read this. 2,000 years ago, a man was born contrary to the laws of life. He lived in poverty and was reared in obscurity. He was the child of a peasant woman and worked in a carpenter's shop until he was 30 years old. For three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home, never wrote a book, never held public office. He never went to college and never set foot in a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He possessed none of the usual traits that accompany greatness. He had no credentials except himself. In his infancy, he startled a king. In childhood, he puzzled doctors and scholars. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature, walked upon the billows as if on pavement, and hushed the sea to sleep. He healed the multitudes without medicine and made no charge for his service. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed on a cross between two thieves. While he was dying... His executioners gambled for the only piece of property he was known to have on this earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a tomb borrowed from another. All history is divided by his coming. 2,000 years have come and gone, and today he's the centerpiece of the human race and the leader of the most important mission in all of history. He never wrote a book, but no library could hold all the books written about him. He never wrote a song, and yet he has furnished the lyrics and melodies for more songs than all the songwriters combined. He never founded a college, but all the schools put together cannot boast having nearly as many students. He never marshaled an army, nor drafted a soldier, nor fired a gun, and yet no leader ever had more volunteers who under his orders have made more rebels drop their weapons and surrender without firing a single shot. He never practiced psychiatry, yet he has healed more broken hearts than all the doctors far and near. How great is his influence? Well, all history is divided by his coming, B.C. and A.D. We call this year 2023 in honor of his birth, the year of our Lord, 2023 A.D. The names of past leaders have long been forgotten. The great men of Greece and Rome are dusty names in the library of time. Scientists, philosophers, kings, generals, and theologians have come and gone, but the name of this man abounds more and more. Though time has spread 2,000 years between the people of this generation and the scenes of the crucifixion, still he lives. Herod could not destroy him, Satan could not stop him, and the grave could not hold him down. He stands alone on the highest pinnacle of heavenly glory, proclaimed of God, acknowledged by angels, adored by saints, and feared by devils as the living, personal Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, and Savior of the world. That's what Christmas is all about. I'm going to read you one more passage and then close. In this brief scripture, you're going to see three different attitudes and actions toward the Savior. 
Here it is. John 1.10. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Can you imagine? He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So you might not recognize him. Many people don't. Unfortunately, even after everything I just read, and after all he did, verse 10 reveals that Emmanuel is often ignored. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. There's always been a great divide in the human race. The majority never recognized Jesus for who he really is and never came to him to have their sins forgiven. You might reject him. Verse 11 says he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Jesus came to the people who should have known him best and they wanted nothing to do with him. They wouldn't even go a few miles away. Wasn't scary enough. Wasn't relevant enough. Didn't meet their standard. You must receive him. While it's true that the world did not recognize him and his own people rejected him, there have always been some who receive him. John 1.12 is one of the most profound verses in the Bible. I love it because it explains clearly how someone can personally become a Christian. You ready? Ready? Chris is ready. Here it is. But to all who did receive him, someone say receive. Receive. To those who believed in his name, say believed. Believe. He gave the right to become children of God. Say become. Become. Three great words. Receive, believe, become. Receive, this literally means to take or to seize. Have you embraced him? Have you taken hold of him? Have you received the greatest gift of all time? The next one is to believe. To believe means you engage your total being so that you put your trust completely in Christ as an act of your own will. So I receive and then I believe. And when you receive and believe, make no mistake, you become. The moment you receive Christ into your life, God gives you the right to become a member of his family, to become a new creation. Behold, I make all things new. Old things have passed away. The word says he's going to finish the work that he started in you. So let's pray like it's Christmas Eve. You ready? All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you right now, Lord, for the gift of Christmas. We know that it's not a day. We know that it's not about presents. It's, it's the whole reason for all of it, God. We just, uh, we just pray that we never take you for granted, that we never fail to see the majesty, that while we do open presents and eat cookies and enjoy one another and get a little bit stressed out, running around shopping and wondering if who's going to show up or if we're going to make it on time, that we just stop and never overemphasize the unimportant but always emphasize, emphasize the all-important, which is you. We just thank you that you've spelled it out. We receive, we believe, and we become. If you're with me, repeat after me. Lord, I receive your grace, your mercy, your love, your forgiveness, your purpose. I receive it. Lord, I believe. I, re I believe what you say I believe you love me and have a plan for my life and I believe you know exactly which gifts I need Lord help me become as I receive and believe help me to become that which you have ordained me to be before the foundations of the earth. Happy birthday, Jesus. I love you. Merry Christmas. Amen. God bless you. I really just pray that you have an amazing Christmas, that you have amazing encounters, that people that you know get reconnected with one another, people in your family get closer, closer to you, but more importantly, closer to the one true God, closer to the amazing gift. And I, I don't know if you heard Kiana earlier, but you were all kind of talking and greeting each other. But if you're around tonight and you don't have a, a, full, a full schedule, you want to be here because 
Man, this choir has been singing their heart out for weeks, celebrating the goodness of God. I'm just doing a, a sermonette, kind of a short message, different from this morning, but they got some wonderful praise and worship Christmas music for you. At 4 o'clock, cookies, coffee, caroling, 5 o'clock service, we'll have you out of here by 6. And we do Christmas Eve right around here, so I hope you can make it. Love you. Bye.